chapter 8, we're going to start by talking about what are the things that your circulatory system does. Now the first very obvious thing that your circulatory system does is transport. And I bet if I asked you, you could tell me some things that your circulatory system transports. Since we've talked about all of the other body systems that we're going to talk about, there should actually be quite a few things that you could list to me here. So think about your digestive system, think about your excretory system, think about your respiratory system, think even about your muscles, and try to make a list of substances that could be transported in your blood. All right, let's hear some suggestions of things that your blood transports. Uh, so let's start over here on this side. How about, Sean, you tell me something that was on your list? <coughs> Carbs, absolutely. And if you were more specific and you said things like glucose, that's definitely true. Glucose is what your blood sugar is referring to. Whether you have high or low glucose in your blood, that's what insulin and glucagon respond to, and that's what's wrong when someone has diabetes. Uh, let's hear something else. Megan, why don't you tell me something on your list? Hormones. Now, there are lots of different hormones. Insulin and glucagon would be an example of a hormone. We talked about other hormones in the digestive unit. Hormones like CCK uh, that stimulates bile production, but hormones by definition are produced in your bloodstream. So anything that's a hormone gets transported by your circulatory system. How about uh, Avery? Tell me one of yours. Sorry? You don't have another one? John, do you have another one? Besides those two things? Anything at all that your blood can carry. Oxygen. So what we just talked about, oxygen, CO2, all of the gases in your body, those are transported by your circulatory system. So we have an example from digestive system. We have some examples from respiratory system. Does anyone have an example of something that maybe comes from your excretory system or from your muscles? All right, I'm going to, oh, you got one. Go ahead. Absolutely, water is transported. Half of your blood is water, uh, and the water part of your blood is where most of these substances are dissolved because water is a really good solvent. Now, I'm going to mention a few other things. Urea or any other waste product is transported by your blood. It comes from your liver to your kidneys, and your kidneys filter it out. I saw, I think John Leggett, I think it was on your list, some other things that had to do with excretory system. You had a couple ions there. Yeah, so like iron, potassium. Uh, now iron has more to do with uh, oxygen, but you're definitely right. Potassium is one of the substances uh, that is involved in your kidneys. So if you mentioned sodium, amino acids, uh, if you mentioned... Uh, uric acid, ammonia, hydrogen ions would be another one. Hydrogen ions are what controls the pH in your blood. I might even mention lactic acid. That comes from your muscle system. That's what's produced when your muscles run out of oxygen. So the idea then is that your circulatory system transports basically everything. Anything that's getting transported in your body is probably going through your circulatory system. Now that usually means your blood. What you'll see in this section is that your blood is not the only part of your circulatory system. There's actually another set of vessels. But basically anything that's transported, even like you guys mentioned at the front here, heroin, should you inject that into your circulatory system, or any other drug, is all getting transported by your circulatory system. So that's number one. Number two is thermoregulation. Thermo refers to heat. So your circulatory system is a huge factor in controlling your body temperature. Uh, I'll show you how this happens when we talk about your blood vessels specifically. But the basic idea is the one that's illustrated over here. When you are hot, 
So when your body temperature rises uh, and your body needs to get rid of some heat, your blood goes to your extremities or to any blood vessel that's at the surface. So when a person is hot, instead of their blood being concentrated in their internal organs, a lot of blood flows to the surface of the skin in the extremities, and that is so that it can exchange heat with the environment, so that you can get rid of some of the extra heat. So, when a person looks red when they're hot, your cheeks get red, your face turns red, that is because your body is actively pushing blood to blood vessels near the surface so that heat can be exchanged. When you are cold, and that would be this picture, notice the difference in where the dark red is. In the picture on the right, the dark red is all in the arms and the legs. In the picture on the left, the dark red is all in the middle. When you're cold, blood goes to your internal organs. So when you're really cold, you might notice, for example, that things like your fingers start to look white, and that's because blood is being redirected away from them toward your internal organs. Another really cool thing about uh, blood flow, uh, and I know the first time someone told me this, I was like, shut up, that can't be true. When you eat, blood is redirected to your internal organs for digestion. And so when you are eating or just after you eat, touch your stomach, it will be cold because on the surface, blood will have all been redirected away. It's a very cool phenomenon. I remember the first time I heard that, I was like, this is awesome. Now, the third thing that your circulatory system has to do with, and I like to group these together, blood clotting, and immunity, and if I had to give one word to this third function, I would say immunity, protecting you from diseases, from pathogens, from infection. Now, blood clotting is a huge reason that you are protected from external pathogens. Blood clotting uh, is what happens when there is a hole in a vessel. And when there's a hole in one of your blood vessels, your blood will clot, so form like a little plug, so that things cannot get in and also things cannot get out of that space. Immunity is a much more broad topic. Uh, so blood clotting is part of immunity, but immunity also has to do with your white blood cells. We've alluded to these, for example, in the unit on excretion, uh, I told you if there were a lot of white blood cells in someone's urine, it probably meant that they had an infection. And we'll talk in this chapter about what exactly your white blood cells are doing when you have an infection. Now at the bottom here, I have two words that describe how the circulatory system functions. And so I'm just going to make this a little higher up so we can see it. Sometimes your circulatory system is what we call an open system. You might remember learning in maybe grade 10 science uh, that when a system is open, that means that there is exchange. Things can get in and things can get out. So in an open system, your circulatory system allows blood to leave vessels and to pool somewhere. Now this doesn't happen for all of your blood. This is more for your white blood cells. So your white blood cells act like an open system. They're constantly going in and out of your arteries and veins and collecting in other different regions of your body. Sometimes though your circulatory system acts like a closed system. This is for your red blood cells as opposed to your white blood cells. You might remember learning in the excretory system, red blood cells are too big to fit through the filter in the glomerulus. They're not supposed to get filtered. White blood cells, uh, it's not that they're necessarily smaller and they can fit, uh, but it's because they have a different function. 
Uh, but red blood cells are not supposed to leave your blood vessels, not unless they're being broken down uh, and the parts of them are being recycled. Now this is a brief overview of the things that your circulatory system does. What we're going to do then is talk about all of the parts of your circulatory system that allow you to achieve this. Uh, we'll talk about transport kind of as the biggest topic. Uh, when we talk about blood vessels in particular, we'll talk about thermal regulation. And at the end of the chapter, we'll talk about immunity and how your body protects you from foreign particles and foreign bacteria. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask uh, about any of the functions of your circulatory system? So your circulatory system has three basic components. And we're going to talk about each of the components in turn. So this is just to give you the overview. You have blood vessels. And the three types of blood vessels are arteries and veins and capillaries. And so there's a picture over here. And I'll repeat this picture again uh, when I get into the details. But one of the things that you'll have to be able to do is recognize by appearance which type of blood vessel we're talking about. So if you notice, the left one is an artery and the right one is a vein. They have an obvious visible difference. Arteries look really thick. Veins look thin and squishy. And that's actually what their characteristic appearance is. Capillaries are these tiny little blood vessels that make nets. And we've seen capillaries before. They surround your nephron. They surround the villi of your small intestine. They're really small blood vessels with thin walls. So you have blood vessels. Then you have the pump, the heart. And we'll spend a considerable amount of time talking just about your heart, since it's the reason that transport does or doesn't happen. If your heart's not working, nothing is being transported, and if nothing is being transported, well, then none of your other systems are going to function. And then finally, we'll talk about your blood itself. So the types of blood cells that you have, including red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and the water that's part of your blood. Now, I'm just going to mention this little test tube here, which I'll refer to again later. If we were to take a sample of your blood and let it settle, this is approximately how it would look. There are three sort of distinct layers in your blood. The plasma layer, which is the water part. That's the part where everything is being transported around. Then there's a really, really thin layer of white blood cells, and then quite a large layer of red blood cells. Now, if we were to give percentages to those, it's close to half and half. Usually, the plasma part is a little bit more than half, and the cell part is a little bit less than half. But definitely, white blood cells are the smallest layer that we find. Now, does anyone want to ask any questions about any of these components so far? So we are going to talk about blood vessels. And like I mentioned, that picture of arteries and veins is showing up again. And we're going to talk about the characteristics of arteries and veins at the same time, because uh, like a lot of things in your body, they're fairly opposite one from the other. If we talk about, first, which direction do they carry blood? Arteries carry blood away from the heart. See how artery and away both start with an A? That's fairly convenient. Veins carry blood towards the heart. You might even use the word arrive. Blood arrives at the heart because of veins. And I like the word arrive because it has a V in it. 
So one distinct difference is the direction that they're flowing. And that's definitely a question that I would ask you when we get to the point of doing a quest on chapter 8. Uh, I might show you which way blood is flowing and ask you, is this an artery or is this a vein? In an artery, the walls are thick. They are muscular. So once again, the top part of that picture represents an artery. And if I look, here's the outside of the artery and here's the inside. Look at how thick that space is. So arteries have thick walls. Arteries are very muscular. Now because of that, pressure is high in arteries. So I mentioned earlier, if an artery to, were to be cut, that's what causes blood to spray out. Now in terms of oxygen content, arteries have high oxygen content almost all the time. There is an exception, and we'll talk about this exception again when we talk about the path of blood flow, but the exception is your pulmonary artery. Your pulmonary artery is the artery between your heart and your lungs, and the reason that artery doesn't have any oxygen in it is because it hasn't been to your lungs yet. It hasn't gone to pick up oxygen. Now if we go on to this section on veins and we compare the same characteristics, the veins have walls that are thin. They're not as muscular. They're weak. They're floppy. So if I look at the structure of a vein, here's the outside of the vein. Here's the inside of the vein. It's definitely not a nice perfect circle. It's thinner. And so that's something that's visibly different between an artery and a vein. The pressure is much lower. And the oxygen content is also low. Veins are the vessels that are taking blood from your cells back to your heart. Your cells, we assume, have used up most of the oxygen that your blood was transporting. Now the exception to this oxygen content rule, just like with the arteries, is your pulmonary vein. So the artery and the vein that connect your heart and your lungs are the exceptions to this rule about oxygen content. Otherwise, arteries usually have high oxygen, veins usually have low oxygen. Now another important thing about veins that it's hard to see from a diagram like that one where I've taken a cross section is that they have valves. So I'm going to sketch a rather rudimentary picture of what a vein might look like from the side. If I were to draw a vein from the side, you might see what looks like two little curvy lines. Uh, those represent valves. Just like with your, say, digestive system, valves are not like a really special thing. They're just a piece of tissue that can open or close uh, depending on whether we want things to move past it or not. These valves are there to prevent backflow and pooling. Blood is only supposed to move one way, so we don't want your blood going backwards. Since veins don't have muscles in them, sometimes there's not a lot pushing blood through your vein to the next spot in your body. So to prevent, let's say, all of your blood from being in your feet, your veins have valves so that the valve will close so blood can't fall back down your leg and end up all in your foot. So we don't want backflow and we don't want pooling, especially in the lower, that's a W, uh, the lower extremities. Now since your veins don't have their own muscles, they depend on skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscle contractions help push blood through your veins. So when you are sitting in a desk like you are now, uh, 
there is pressure on some of your veins. Blood might not be moving through them well. It is a good idea to wiggle your toes. If you wiggle your toes, you are forcing skeletal muscle contractions, and that is helping blood flow through your veins back up towards your heart. Uh, so anyone who's ever told you to stop wiggling your leg while you're sitting, you tell them, no, this is biologically necessary so that blood does not pool in my lower extremities. I'm causing skeletal muscle contractions. This is actually really good for me. All right, we're going to talk about capillaries next. This is the third type of blood vessel. Capillaries connect arteries and veins. And you'll see what I did here. I made the arteries red and the veins blue. This is a pretty typical coloring technique to represent that arteries have oxygenated blood and veins have deoxygenated blood. That's the typical color that we represent them. I'm not going to ask you to memorize that, but when you're looking at pictures, say, in your textbook, that's what you'll notice is that things that have oxygen are red and things that don't are blue. So capillaries, you'll notice in my picture at the bottom, are this whole section in the middle. And part of them looks red and part of them looks blue. That's because they are the spot where the change occurs. They have very thin walls, we already knew this, to allow exchange of nutrients and waste. So nutrients would be things like oxygen, glucose, potassium, sodium. Waste would be things like urea, excess hydrogen ions. But your capillaries have very, very thin walls to allow the exchange of nutrients and waste. Now, if I was to superimpose on this picture what is actually happening, in the background of where the capillaries are, there would be a cell. Now, there would actually be millions of cells, but I'm trying to be as simple as possible. Capillaries always surround cells or groups of cells so that cells can exchange materials with the capillaries that are around them. Uh, so we're talking about the exchange of materials. Your capillaries surround cells. For example, we know they surround your alveoli. They surround the villi and microvilli of your small intestine. But they're around all over the place. There are capillaries anywhere that there is a cell. Now the pressure drops in your capillaries. And this is something uh, that we could use to ask you a question. There's a question at some point in your textbook that shows a little diagram. Uh, where it shows uh, blood pressure along the side. And it shows a vessel where the blood pressure is high, where the blood pressure is low, and where the blood pressure is really low. Arteries, veins, capillaries. Arteries have high blood pressure. Veins have low blood pressure. Capillaries have really, really low blood pressure. Now, what controls the movement of blood inside of your capillaries are little things called circular muscles. I could call them valves. I could even call them sphincters. So that's what circular muscles are. We saw them in your digestive system. For example, your esophageal sphincter is at the top of your stomach, and it opens and closes to allow food to enter your stomach or not. Now, these circular muscles cause two things, vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Vasoconstriction happens when they contract. Vasodilation happens when they relax. So when these little muscles contract, blood can't get through. When they relax, blood can get through. So this restricts flow, and this allows flow. 
Now, why would your blood vessels want to do this? Well, there's a number of reasons, but a very important one is the control of temperature. Vasoconstriction restricts the flow of blood. So it keeps blood from flowing to all of your blood vessels. This allows you to conserve heat. Vasodilation lets blood flow through all of your little capillaries, even the ones at the surface of your skin. And this allows you to release heat or to cool down. So one of the functions of your circulatory system was thermoregulation, and this is one of the ways that it accomplishes this. In your capillary, the valves or sphincters, which are little circular muscles, either contract or relax. If they contract, blood flow is restricted and you conserve heat. If they relax, blood flow is allowed and heat can be released. Now the other thing is that they are the most numerous type of vessel. There are more of these than any other blood vessel that you have, and that's because they're so small. You have lots and lots and lots of really small capillaries. So I'm just going to talk about this picture for a minute so that you can see some of the ways we might represent things visually when we're talking about capillaries. The first thing that would be important for you to recognize is which way blood is flowing. Since this one is red and it says that, this represents the artery side. Since this one is blue and it says so, that represents the vein. Now you might remember in our section on the kidney, when an artery starts branching off and becoming smaller and smaller sections, we can call it an arteriole. When a vein starts branching off and making smaller and smaller sections, it is called a venule. Those are the names for branches off of arteries and veins. Now in between an artery and a vein, blood will be flowing from the artery through the capillaries towards the vein. So if we were to ever ask you direction of blood flow, blood flow starts in your artery, then goes through your capillary, and then goes through your veins. Never the other way around. Blood only flows in one direction. You'll also see, if you look at the picture, on some of the little branches, there's like a little bump on them. That is supposed to represent the valves or the little circular muscles that contract or relax to let blood flow or to not let blood flow. Now that's a little bit about the types of blood vessels that you have. Does anyone want to ask any questions about the types of blood vessels that you have? All right, so then we're going to talk about next pathways. Where does the blood go in your circulatory system? One of the pathways is the pulmonary pathway. This is the pathway that is between not sure what's up with me today, between your heart and your lungs. And the reason that we differentiate this pathway from the rest of it is because this is where the exceptions occur. So between your heart and your lungs, the artery has no oxygen and the vein has oxygen. And that's weird. That's unusual. That's different from the rest of the circulation in your body. The next one is called systemic. Systemic means your body in general, everywhere else in your body except for between your heart and your lungs. So this would be all your major organs and tissues except for one. There is a separate pathway called the coronary pathway, and it is for your heart. 
And some people forget that even though the heart is pumping blood, it also has to have blood vessels supplying oxygen to actual heart tissue, removing waste from heart tissue. So we got to remember that even though the heart is pumping blood, there are also veins and arteries and capillaries all over the heart so that the heart itself can have oxygen and the heart itself can get rid of waste. So this picture on the left represents two things. Uh, it represents pulmonary and systemic circulation. Now I don't expect that you draw this whole picture. What I would like to do is point out something distinctive about the colors. When I take a look at what is going on between my heart and the rest of my body, what I often see is that there are red arteries and then there are blue veins. Now we know that that means that arteries are carrying oxygen and veins are carrying little to no oxygen. And so when I take a look at the picture up here, take a look at what's going on in the lungs. See how they're partially blue and partially red? That's to indicate that that's the point where the oxygen level in your blood changes, is at your lungs. So if I were to look at this picture and I were to ask myself, hey, which of those are arteries and which of those are veins? These blue ones here, that go in and out of lungs, those are arteries, and the red ones are the veins. So that's just reinforcing that in most places, arteries have the oxygen and veins don't, except in the blood vessels that go in and out of your lungs. Now on the right is a little bit of information about coronary circulation. Again, I don't expect you to draw this whole picture, but I just wanted you to be aware, for example, that aside from something like this, this is the big major artery leaving your heart. That's how the blood gets pumped to the rest of your body. But that's not the only artery that's attached to your heart. There are a whole bunch of other arteries on the surface of your heart providing blood to your actual heart tissue. So just don't forget that. There aren't only two arteries attached to your heart. There are actually a whole bunch. Some of them are pumping the blood and some of them are providing blood to your heart tissue. The same is true for veins. So this picture is for veins and this one is about arteries. The key idea is that there are veins and arteries all over the surface of the heart, and when we dissect a heart, you'll be able to see this. 